All right, we are lucky to be sitting down here at Snow Basin before a concert with conductor Randall Craig Fleischer. Welcome to Tan Van, Randall. It's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. My pleasure. Uh, all right, so we're in the mountains up at Snow Basin, and you are currently you're in L.A., but you've conducted symphonies even in Alaska. So I'm assuming you're somewhat at home here. And your Valley, is that right? Yes. Well, yeah. I'm still the music director of the Anchorage Symphony. This coming season will be my 20th year. I have a symphony in Ohio where I grew up, uh, uh, the Youngstown Symphony. I grew up in Canton, actually. And I'm the music director of a third symphony in uh, just north of New York City, the Hudson Valley Philharmonic. Uh, and I'm lucky to go all over the world as a guest conductor. So as you travel all over the world, how do you, with your with the different symphonies, how do you take on those personalities? And you know, how do you get them each to perform at their best each night? Well, you know, I, I it's a, a question of sort of uh, guiding with love, if you will, <laughs> more in, along the lines of encouragement. Now, an orchestra like the Utah Symphony, this is a world class symphony, and we have a phenomenal rhythm section and two amazing singers. So. I just kind of start waving my hands and we go. And mm-hmm. that's kind of that. Uh, they're great at what they do. I'm clear uh, with my baton and I know these songs and everything like that. Everybody really can do their job well. So it's just like, boom, we're off and running. Do you enjoy that more or do you enjoy a little bit more work? I, I, I like the more detailed. I, I think any conductor would say, you know, I like the typical four or five rehearsal, you know, full classical uh, thing where you can really dig into the piece, mm-hmm. make your mark on it, uh, uh, and live it. But, you know, this is fun, too. Uh, my dad was a drummer in a swing band. These mm-hmm. Sinatra, I grew up with Sinatra and Ella. Uh, uh, and uh, so I kind of love, I mean, I had a show run on Broadway that I co-created, Rocktopia, which is a big rock fusion thing. I, I'm an American musician. My models are Bernstein and, you know, Aaron Copeland and Morton Gould and those guys who, 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 were classically trained and they were primarily classical musicians, but they had curiosities, interests, and passions in different directions. How, now, how does that work as far as conducting in the different cities? You said you're, you kind of hang your hat in L.A. That's home, And then yeah. how much time do you spend in each of the cities for rehearsal before shows? Well, I mean, it's usually a week per concert okay. if it's a classical show. Uh, if it's pops, it's usually one rehearsal and on we go. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm in, uh, Anchorage, you know, 12 or 14 weeks a year. I'm in Youngstown, 12 or 14, 15 weeks a year. I'm in Poughkeepsie, five or six weeks a year. And then I'm uh, on a plane guest conducting somewhere. So I'm basically traveling more than half the year. Do you love it? I do. You I don't still like, love it? I, I, I love it. He has kids in a family. I have too, a daughter. So, yeah. yeah. She's going off to college yeah. this fall. So I better love it because oh. <laughs> <laughs> college is expensive. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I love being a musician. I love being a conductor and a composer arranger. I must tell you, the schlepping <laughs> has gotten way old. Yeah. Airports and, and flight delays and waiting for your baggage and crammed into the little seat. That part is old. Once I get off the plane, I love it. Okay, so this next question comes from Ogden's own conductor, Michael Palumbo. Mm-hmm. He's also the conductor for the Chamber Orchestra, Ogden. Uh-huh. And he was curious to know what some of your favorite pieces are to conduct. Oh, gosh. I, I used to answer that question, same as who are my favorite composers, whomever I'm conducting that day. Yeah, that's, but, the, that's the canned one. Exactly. Is that the, yeah. It's my, when I compose. But after a few beers, you exactly. would answer it like. <laughs> uh, my two favorite composers are Beethoven and Stravinsky. But I, I hasten to say, you know, Mozart, Brahms, Copeland, Bernstein, Tchaikovsky, Mussorgsky, Puccini, all the E's. Uh, I mean, I, I love them all. It's ma- I mean, I'm so blessed that I live my life as a musician almost entirely immersed in, in somebody else's genius mm. and it. trying to bring that to life. So uh, I can tell you the most difficult pieces to conduct. Uh, Madame Butterfly, Puccini's opera, Madame Butterfly, is the hardest piece I've ever had to conduct. I've done two productions of it. Um, in terms of 20th century pieces, the Christopher Rouse trombone concerto is the most rhythmically complex thing. But to be honest with you, I'm so fully immersed any given rehearsal in the challenges of that piece, that piece feels like the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Hmm. 
you know, because I just, you know, the, these composers, they're such geniuses. And, and I want to I ri- get the musicians to rise to the occasion and really nail it and really give a compelling performance. So, you know, every single time I'm always sort of feeling, oh, I'm not worthy of this piece. And, you know, God, I wish I had more and more rehearsal and, and you know, things like that. Now, is the goal then to in any way make it your own and the symphony's own? Or is the goal to do the opposite of that? It, Stay true to the piece. It, yeah. you ca- I mean, I, I'm a composer's advocate. Mm. I my task as a conductor is to figure out what's the statement that the piece is being is is being made by this composer. Not just the overall piece, every movement, every section, every phrase, every note. What does it mean? What is reflecting reflective of the human experience in this piece, in this note, in this phrase, blah blah blah, and then to bring that to life. Uh, you can't help. Uh, even though I start from the score. Uh, I mean, I certainly listen to listen to recordings. Any conductor does that. But I try, like I say, I'm a composer's advocate. I try to just start from my interpretation from what I see in the score, hacking through it on the piano myself, and, and try to get closer and closer and closer to that composer's intention. But there's no escaping it. My personality is in that interpretation. I would think so, I, yeah. It's like any stage director, anybody. You're you're reading that Shakespeare and coming to your own conclusions about what it means, and then bringing that to life with the actors. It's the same for a conductor. Uh, I'm not really so much consciously trying to say, well, this is the Randy Fleischer way, you know what I'm saying, or anything like that. I'm trying to get to the Brahms way, or the, in this way, the you know uh, the Gershwin way, or whatever. Uh, um, but it's filtered through my experience, my emotions, me. We're going to see your style on stage here in uh, just about half an hour, 30, well, about an hour now. Uh, I, Out of the blue, I watched a, a YouTube video last week before we knew we were going to have you on about the different styles of conductors, mm-hmm. where some are very uh, subtle in their yep. movements and, and some are uh, uh, much less or more so, like right. lots of movements. Wilder. So how would you describe your style of conducting? God, I, I think I'm the last person to ask that. <laughs> uh, uh, it's torture for me to watch a video of me, my own Try conducting. Try listening to yourself all the time. Yeah, yeah ex- <laughs> I'm sure we're all this, you know, self-conscious yeah. about whatever is our thing that we do. Uh, but uh, I, I think I'm on somewhat on the wilder side, but less and less as I get older. Mm. Uh, that's a thing I, I can do more with less wildness. Mm-hmm. And, and the older I get, the more I try to be subtle and kind of get out of the way of the musicians. You know, in the post Leonard Bernstein era, there is this expectation that, th- that the conductor is, is a sort of dancer entertainer figure. Mm. And he was a, a genius musician. I studied with him uh, uh, and I knew him. And he, he, the musicianship was so real. The genius was so real. But he was also a showman. Mm-hmm. He was absolutely aware of the audience watching him, and he put on a dazzlingly brilliant show for them. 95% of his conducting wasn't that, but there's that little 5% of showbiz in, in LB. Once in a blue moon, I'm thinking, you know what, I better make sure I give the cymbal crash cue clear enough, not only so that the person crashing the cymbal sees it, but the audience doesn't think I missed it, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Some, something like that. But mostly I'm about joining the musicians together. That's what a conductor does. I'm the glue. And as much as I can do to get out of the way and let them do their thing and feed them the sort of psycho-emotional uh, content of the piece as they play so that they play in a in a committed and dramatic and emotional way that's my task so you have a a rock star vibe to you man with the passion dark sunglasses black (laughs) t-shirt black pants uh you come from a a, a fan your your father was a musician if you weren't conducting what would you be doing i don't know how to do anything else i mean i have a rock band a, a rock project called rocktopia uh, which is, has toured the country a couple of times and had a six-week residency on Broadway uh, this last uh, March and April. Congratulations. So, uh, thank you. Uh, so, I, and I've done many other rock fusion projects with a lot of great, uh, you know, John Cale from the Velvets, Sterling Morrison, Velvet Underground, Garth Hudson from the band, uh, uh, Ani Kavafian, Natalie Merchant, you know, well, the, the list goes on. I've been to two from Natalie Merchant. I've been a fan of them since 10,000 Maniacs. Yeah, exactly. And before. I did a thing with the 10,000 Maniacs also ah. in the post-Natalie era. I'm a huge rock and roll fan. I've done some native fusion works too with mm. several uh, native fusion bands. So I have this curiosity as a composer, arranger, and as a conductor. It's like, well, you know, uh, what if somebody did that? Well, I'm somebody, so I'll do it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I hooked up with a, a dear friend of mine, Rob Evan, who's sung with the Utah Symphony a number of times, uh, who used to tour with Trans-Siberian Orchestra and has a passion for, you know, he's an operatically trained tenor who's gone the rock, the sort of Broadway rock version, saying uh, Jean Valjean and Les Mis on Broadway, and he's one of the original Jekylls and Jekyll and Hyde, blah, blah, blah. So Rob and I hooked up as kind of as brothers in this quest for symphonic rock fusion. Uh, so, you know, Rocktopia is a successful project. We're touring Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York uh, this fall. Um, so, I, I mean, I just think of myself as an American musician. Uh, uh, mostly classical, but fully conversant and immersed in the vernacular of my day. And tonight is awesome. It's a little different. Explain the format here this evening. Uh, it's a it's a Sinatra Ella tribute uh, with some of the original Nelson Riddle arrangements for both. Uh, uh, Frank Sinatra. Was, this was put together by uh, my agent John Such, who's also a producer and packager of Pops programs. Both Capathia and Tony are phenomenal talents. Uh, they were both involved in crafting this program, and especially Tony, who's a uh, a really busy. Uh, a, I wouldn't say Sinatra impersonator. He's one of these guys that does tribute shows to Sinatra. He's a phenomenal uh, uh, jazz, classical, blues pianist. So between John and Capathia. Uh, and and Tony, this program was put together. You know, Ella and Sina and Frank loved each other. They had a profound respect for each other, and especially Sinatra was in awe of Ella, even though Sinatra was the way bigger star. And if you see footage of them performing together, you can actually see when she starts to scat. Fra Frank, like all of us, would just stand there like we're seeing some. I, I don't know what what. Uh, what's to say some prophet from heaven singing to us in this fully improvised musical language that she made up not only in general in terms of really bringing human scatting to jazz but she was making it up on the spot that you know so you can see he's just like because he was very, very gifted and tra well-trained musician. Sinatra was the real deal. He wasn't just a pretty boy with a great voice. He had a lot of input with Nelson Riddle in, uh, I mean, if you read his books, they talk about the, the relationship in crafting all these brilliant arrangements. You know, doesn't take away Nelson Riddle's genius one bit. He was a genius, but Frank had a lot to say. So he, he was the real deal as a musician. And, and all of us can't help but be in awe of, of both of them, really. So this show and the chemistry between uh, Capathia and Tony is phenomenal. And they, they both have this, uh, it was just on the ride up, Tony said, you know, uh, he fell in love with swing era music. That was his uh, parental rebellion music. Because mm. <laughs> oh, his parents that. were, you know, rock and roll fans, you know. Was fa Don't you uh, listen to that swing? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You'll fall in with the wrong crowd, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, oh, that's um, funny. That's a great line. Uh, but uh, so it's a real tribute. The original arrangements, uh, uh, many of them, uh, also some you know tribute. I have a couple of arrangements in the show where the two are combined very nicely in in a similar sort of loving way to to really expose the talents of these two wonderful singers in the same way that Frank and Ella did when they sang together. Now you were talking about the awe of musicians. Uh, is there? Is there something out there that has just frightened you since the beginning that oh, you yeah. need to do? At oh, some that point? I need to do, or something that is just uh, simply like beyond. a bucket list? No, well, it's something like that. But something that is just out of sheer, you know, uh, fear or awe of not, you know. With you know what, I'm always fearful. Every single rehearsal and every single concert, I get a, I hear that, that a, a and it goes, you know, and, <laughs> and I remember working, you know, because some people have the notion that that amateurs get nervous and professionals don't. Let me tell you, <laughs> that is so not true. So it's okay true. to be nervous. I, I did uh, four shows at the Hollywood Bowl with the L.A. Phil and Kenny Rogers mm. about 13 years ago. So Kenny was in his 60s, had been on the top of the country, you know, game for whatever, 40 some years. Yeah. He could barely form a sentence. Mm. He was that nervous. And God bless Kenny Rogers. He put on a great show every time. We're all nervous to do it. Well, like, for instance, classically, I, you know, I'm doing my first Bach B minor mass this year. That's two hours of utter complexity, utter genius. And, and it's an enormous task to feel like I'm on top of every single note in all of that complex texture. Wow. So I'm in the learning stage now. Uh, that's on my bucket list. Uh, I've done Mahler one, two, four, and five. Want to do Mahler eight? You know, just just pieces like that. 
Uh, in terms of, you know, rock artists, you know, we're talking with Robert Plant about getting involved in Rocktopia. Obviously, can you know, I, one of my mashups is with Cashmere. So the notion of you know, Robert Plant actually singing my arrangement of his song would be oh. like, you know, oh, I hope that happens dream come true. Well, Dee Snider's going to do it. Uh, oh, we uh, Also, Pat Monahan from uh, Train was played, uh, did Rocktopia for three weeks three weeks on Broadway. Um, so sure, there, there. I mean, I've worked with Yo-Yo Ma. I, you know, there are others I would love to work with Long Long. You know, I've never, I met him, never worked with him. You know, things like that. There are artists on, on the planet that I would love to work with uh, uh, before I kick the bucket. So you are not, nowhere near done yet. No, sir. All right, there is about 45 minutes to show. So before we let you go, one last thing. What is the state of classical music in 2018? Have you seen a rise in popularity at events and orchestras where there, because of the the ability to get the word out, you know, social media and you know, no. communication? No. Uh, uh, classical music is struggling, uh, as it always has, an uphill battle mm. uh, because it's just a different kind of entertainment. Uh, if you go to a U2 show, not only are the songs great, the the visuals are spectacular. But classical music is entirely uh, aural, A-U-R-E-L. It's entirely, it's an ear thing. So uh, uh, it uh, can be tricky for us to compete. In addition to that, these latest generation of TV talk show hosts don't bring the classical mu- musicians on like Johnny did, like right, Merv right, Griffin did, yeah. like Dick Dick Cav- I remember talking with violinist Itzhak Perman. He did the Tonight Show with Johnny uh, 45 or 46 times. Wow. Jay Leno came in, done. Hmm. I remember seeing Merv Griffin. We need to make uh, a call. Uh, yeah, changing. exactly. Yeah. Uh, having Orson Welles on to read Shakespeare. And that was the way he was closing the show. And he was like, giddy. He's like, oh my God, Orson's going to come on. He's going to read some Shakespeare. He's going to read. So so the previous generation of, of pop culture doorkeepers, or gatekeepers, if you will, were really advocates for classical music, even though they knew that wasn't going to sell any sponsorship, that wasn't going to make them rich quickly or anything like that. But this current generation, we're sort of removed from those talk shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and what serves as classical music on PBS now is more sh- are more shows like my show, Rocktopia, or Celtic Woman, or you know, f- three Irish tenors, you know, things like that. Some show show so, in the show. So we're real classical music in its pure form is less and less visible. And, and my daughter's 18. Obviously, she's a huge participant in Instagram and all this kind of stuff. But the kids are busy making their own videos and sending them to each other. And the kind of, you know, 40-minute symphony, sit down and focus on it, uh, a culture that classical music is, isn't kind of what's really hot on, on, on social media these but, days. But podcasts are hot. And I'm wondering if there's a way to podcasts tease that. Podcasts are hot and we're we're trying... I mean, I'm happy to say, you know, Knockwood, my three orchestras are doing fine. The or- the Utah Symphony is doing very, very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but every, I remember, you know, when I my one little private lesson with Leonard Bernstein, uh, we had lunch together and everything. We talked mostly about this, mm. that it's an uphill climb for for classical music in our culture. It's still classical music is still huge in Europe. It's still cool if you're a twenty something hipster to go hear a symphony concert or an opera or things like that. Here. It's more a thing that mommy and daddy go back to after their kids are grown and they have some money and some time. Uh, But it's an uphill climb that we're climbing, but it's still uphill. Randall, thanks so much for your time tonight. My pleasure, guys. Good luck with the performance. You bet. 